But <coughs> for those of you who've only come here to hear Chris and not me speak, um, mm. we are extremely lucky to have Chris come and give this um, very intriguing, intriguingly titled talk. For those of you who don't know Chris's background, he um, originally did his, um, and much of his study at the University of York in phonetics and phonology. Um, before coming back to us at, at Aarhus and still holding an affiliation there. Chris has serious expertise in language development, in Bayesian statistics. He's uh, contributed to the field already with uh, some really, really um, impactful meta-analyses. So um, I'm sure we're all in for a serious treat here today, Chris. <laughs> Would you prefer questions at the end or as you go? Um, I think at the end. At the end, okay. Sense, yeah. Yeah, so questions at the end and uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, let me just do one last test of the sound. Cool, that still works, because that'll become relevant later on. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about turn-taking in human and non-human animals, and the different models and mechanisms that have been proposed. Um, and specifically, I'll talk about what we can learn from the animal literature in terms of the models that have been proposed there, and what we can actually use them for looking at, for example, the development of turn-taking in early infancy. Um, and this is a bit of a side project to my, to my PhD. It's a bit of a like, guilty pleasure project. I think everyone has them where, where if you get tired of reading about, in my case it's phonetics and phonology and phonological development and how infants learn speech sounds, then I go to the animal literature and start reading about bush crickets or about <coughs> elephants trying to communicate to each other through the ground and things like that. So this is really my guilty pleasure project. Um, yes, okay. And a quick introduction to, to turn-taking in general, um, I think is in order before we sort of go into the overview of the talk. Um, because as with sort of most things in life, when you scratch the surface a little bit deeper, then you actually find out that it's a really complex phenomenon, right? And turn-taking is one of those um, phenomena where you suddenly realize how complex it actually is, what we're doing every single day. And it feels intuitive and it feels natural, but it's a seriously complex process. Because it's a cognitively challenging or cognitively demanding process, right? And turn-taking is organized to, um, well, it's organized to limit the amount of overlap between speakers, right? No one wants to speak with someone who's constantly interrupting you. On the other hand, no one wants to speak with someone who takes too long between the between your finished speaking and, and the other person speaks, right? That should feel fairly intuitive to everyone here. Um, but a, visual, a visualization like this, um, with speaker A at the top and speaker B at below, right? Um, this latency between the turns, right? When one speaker, when the role of speaker and listener shifts between the speakers involved in the conversation or in the interaction, um, this latency is surprisingly short. And it's so short, in fact, that it's at the limit of human performance. So if we see, if we look at a 100 meter sprint, sprint race, the latency between the gun, starting gun going off and them actually starting to run, that's about 200 milliseconds. And we see the same latency in human, human conversation, human interaction in general. Um, so in a sense, right, we're all 100 meter sprinters in the day-to-day -day interactions that we do. Um, and crucially, right, the semiotic significance of this modal latency is crucial to the interaction. So I think we've all been, again, in the situation where if you have to answer a dangerous question, such as, is this hat too big for my head? Do I need a haircut? If you don't respond, right, within the modal latency, you're going to infer that there's something that the other person is hiding. Right, I asked my mum, do I need a haircut? And she said, no. <laughs> meaning that she probably thought, I need a haircut, which most people probably would agree. <laughs> um, but this is, the, this is quite amazing, right, in terms of what we have to do in everyday conversation. And I said that we we're all 100 meter sprinters, but in fact, we're, we cheat a bit in the sense that we multitask both comprehension and production at the same time, right? We're doing both in parallel. So, which means that the responses of speaker B need to be starting, or it, you need to start planning that um, your turn or your utterance in the middle of the other speaker's turn. So production, and lots of psycholinguistic studies have shown this, takes around a second to get going. Um, 
and on average utterances are two seconds, so it means you have to start actually planning your utterance one second um, into the other person's turn. So of course this shifts back and forth, right? This is what conversation or interaction is. This is what turn taking is. Okay. I think it's also just before we get going as well, right? Um, important to note what's at stake here. What's really the interesting questions that we can ask about turn taking and how this fits into the general picture we have of communication in general. And once we look at um, across distinct languages, so here's a um, graph of 10 different languages that have been looked at in the Stivers et al. paper, looking at latencies between turns. And here we see, so from Danish to Italian to Lao and Korean, we see similar structures of turn taking. So every single language that has been investigated in this sense has this sort of universal um, latency of around 200 milliseconds. And amazingly, right, these languages are, exhibit quite a lot of diversity in terms of whether they have, for example, whether they're verb initial or verb final. And you might think that could have an effect on the latencies that we see in these languages, and yet we don't. We see this universal structure um, in terms of the um, latencies that we see. We also see continuity with non-human turn-taking systems. So if we look evolutionarily, if we look at to bonobos and chimps, um, or if we look to orangutans, they gesture with a similar latency um, as we do in human language. Uh, and if, even if we look at the lesser apes, so uh, gibbon monkeys, for example, which is a vocal species, we also see similar latencies um, in their turn-taking systems as we do to human language as well. So that might again suggest that we have um, that we're using the same system, that in a sense our turn-taking system is derived um, either in parallel to or from this, um, these earlier turn-taking systems in these animals. And then lastly we have the onset of proto-conversation in early ontogeny. So in early infancy we actually find that um, infants are surprisingly good at turn-taking. Right? And that's surprising because it's such a complex feat of cognition and yet tiny little human infants can do this. Okay. So all of these, all of this evidence really suggests that turn taking has maybe has deep roots in human nature, right? If it's universal across all distinct languages and we see it in different species, we see it early on in human development, well maybe this interactional structure in a sense sort of allows language to happen. Maybe the interactional um, structure is what um, yeah, is the basis for communication that we have. Okay? Cool. Okay. So today, we're going to be talking about um, sort of three different perspectives on turn-taking. Um, and we'll start with uh, the developmental origins of turn-taking. So we completed a meta-analysis uh, that's now out in child development last year um, on the early developmental trajectory of turn-taking. So how do infants, um, how do infants latencies, response latencies change um, with time. Then we'll look at a um, corpus of turn-taking data um, where we're comparing um, uh, where we're comparing infants with and without autism and their interactions with their caregivers, um, seeing how whether the developmental trajectories differ according to uh, whether they grow up with or without autism. And then lastly, we'll look at the animal turn-taking models and see whether, well, how we can apply the models that we see from the animal um, world and see whether we can use them to, um, in some way, methodologically improve uh, how we look at turn-taking in humans. Okay. So, we'll start with the developmental origins of turn-taking. And here's a classic clip of two babies interacting, two baby twins. And try to note the conversational exchange.
Okay. So that's quite a nice, I mean, that could be a, an adult conversational exchange in a sense, right? Uh, not very informative exchange, but, but it sounds like a conversation, right? Between two very passionate, passionate people discussing politics or something, something else. Um, now, despite them, we know probably that they're not discussing politics, then the structure of turn-taking seems to be there already, right? At an early point in development, despite its complexity. Um, that we see. Okay, and you might ask, well, why are we starting, why is looking at the developmental origins of turn-taking really interesting? Um, and I would argue that um, understanding any sort of system in its own right, right requires some sort of account of its development. So this is also why I'm interested in phenological development, is that you, you can't necessarily look at the phenological system, right, the sound system that that we as adults use, we can't understand this without looking at how it develops, looking, looking at its interactive parts, its sort of motor development and perceptual development and so forth. So looking at the developmental origins of turn-taking may allow us to look at the interacting parts of what's required to develop this, this complex feat of cognition. Okay, and I need to press the space and not the arrow. Um, so as we saw, right, it, the um, infant development, the infant development of turn taking, proceeds from fast these fast proto conversations. So just as we saw before, right, where it's almost an adult conversation, but then the literature has noted a slowdown at, from around nine months of age. So infants actually start out by being exceptionally good at this, and they start slowing down before speeding up again. And this slowdown has been. Um, has been uh, sort of described in terms of this interaction engine. And it sort of relates to what I've already been talking about, that we have a cognition for interaction, that the interactive part of cognition is really the important part, and language is sort of superimposed on, on this interactional infrastructure or the interaction, in, interactional um, architecture. So the slowdown then might be that infants are starting to learn how to squeeze complex utterances into the interactional structure that they already have available to them. And Levinson in um, 1995 um, has sort of posited that these are the components that, of the interaction engine. These are what comprises our ability um, to interact with each other in, in the way that we do. Um, and the theory is that um, Parts of this interaction engine are already present from birth. So, for example, the strict timing aspect of interact the interaction engine is there, which allows infants to to take turns um, in a very straightforward way. But other things like intention attribution need to be are um, learned at a later point in development. Okay. Okay. So that's what it's been related to um, so far, and that's what we were actually interested in investigating with the meta-analysis that we did. Um, so we conducted a systematic review of the turn-taking literature. Um, so screening, I think it was something like 600 different studies, um, looking at uh, those that reported uh, estimates of the response latency of infants and also took the adult latencies when we could. And we conducted this, um, first of all, a citation coupling plot. So here we have all of the citations that are close to one another um, have a large degree of overlap in their bibliographies. And we found uh, with this um, screening and screening process and looking at this literature that it was quite fractured in a sense. Right? So we have three individual clusters here of studies where the blue ones looked a lot, uh, looked at autism, uh, how turn-taking developed in autism. The green ones looked at uh, interactions in free play sessions whereas the orange ones were slightly more structured interactions. So we saw this fractured literature and wanted to do a meta-analysis of all of them um, in order to see whether we could say anything about the developmental trajectory of infant response latencies over time. But we need to note that, it, that this is a fractured literature and sometimes the infant response latencies were sort of reported as a side, side result to these um, other studies that were looking at something else. Okay, and we took a, again, a meta-analytic approach to, to these studies, which essentially means that we're weighting each individual study by the amount of participants that it has in its sample size, right? So a study with a larger sample will contribute more to the estimate in the meta-analytic effect size 
than studies that have a smaller sample size. Okay. Um, and running a Bayesian meta-analysis on these studies showed us that, so here's a graph of um, infant age and months on the x-axis and infant response latency on the y-axis. Um, and here we see some sort of potentially quadratic relationship, right? We had a quadratic model. <laughs> um, we ran a quadratic model on it, which is probably why we see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we see sort of a slowdown, right, up until 20 months of age, and a speed up again in infant latency. Okay? And again, we're, we're as skeptical of this as you are. <laughs> we're not claiming that this is the... Uh, this is all the studies you showed before? Yes. Okay. All of the estimates from the individual studies. Uh, and inversely related to sample size, the size of the dot as well. So bigger the dot, the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could say it's not incompatible with a quadratic development. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that's, that is what we conclude in the <laughs> next slide as well. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. We also extracted when we could all of the um, population level characteristics of the participants that were um, involved in this. So here we have a plot again from response latency on the y-axis, but here we have different populations and the developmental trajectories um, that we have available for these populations, right? Um, and again, the data are extremely sparse. Um, so we have, I think, one, one data point for aut autism um, studies, for example. Um, but again, that does seem to be a greater latency than, than the typically developing um, as well. Okay, so once we had Conducting this meta-analysis, the results were quite unsatisfactory, right? Um, in the sense that, well, we couldn't say much about the in interaction engine hypothesis with this, because the data were just so sparse, the literature was so fractured that it's difficult to say anything relevant. So again, right, as Ricardo said, this is not inconsistent, not incompatible with the interaction engine hypothesis. We see some sort of slowdown, potentially. But again, that should be, not be taken as strong evidence for this, for this interaction engine hypothesis. Um, okay, yes, there it is. What we did find to be quite robust was a strong correlation with adult response latencies across all of these studies and also across all of the distinct populations. Um, but because we are relying on aggregate data, right, we're, we're relying on re reported data from other studies and extracting only the relevant data from those studies, then we don't really know about the timescales of this correlation between adult and infant response latencies. We don't know whether it's by turn by turn that each um, that the infant and caregiver are adapting to each other, or or what's going on. Whether it's more of a longitudinal time scale. Okay. So what are the next steps after this? Well, we um, suggested in the meta-analysis that we can do better than what we than what we have. We don't have much evidence for what's going on initially with infant response latencies. So we need fine-grained longitudinal studies with turn by turn latencies. We also need to look, to a greater extent, at the reciprocity between child and adult latencies, right? So to what extent do they adapt on, a, on, a, on an interaction-to-interaction -interaction basis um, and a turn-by-turn -turn basis as well? And then we relied on age, right, to look at these developmental trajectories, but that's not really satisfactory in terms of capturing the individual variability of each individual child, right? We need sort of more social measures and cognitive measures um, to do this. Okay. So, with those lessons in mind from the, from the meta-analysis, um, we've now started conducting analysis of um, a corpus of turn-by-turn um, -turn latencies um, in populations with and without autism. Okay, and again, one of the reasons why we're looking at um, infants with autism, with and without autism, is that they exhibit disruption of the interaction engine in some sense, right? So, Authors often note that um, difficulty with intention attribution and so forth, um, there we go, uh, intention attribution and contingent responses. So the fact that sometimes the responses that infants with autism um, give in a given context aren't context dependent is, um, is something interesting to look at, right? Um, 
But we also need to note that there's substantial heterogeneity in the behaviours associated with autism, that some, um, some uh, diagnostic behaviours are more associated with uh, social aspects um, of cognition, whereas others are associated with um, multimodal orchestration and so forth. Okay. And the questions that we can ask with this data set are interesting to note in terms of this interaction engine because it allows us to look at the multi-directionality within and beyond the infant. And what I mean by this is that sometimes when we're looking at the trajectories of development within the infant, right, so how it develops, um, how each individual infant develops over time, um, we see sometimes these cascades um, influencing each other. So for example, a motor delay might later on lead to a language development delay and so forth. So it sort of is bifurcating into these different trajectories of development. And these diagnoses and social aspects of cognition contribute to that, of course, to the individual infant, but they also go beyond the infant in the sense that it also in influences how the adults <coughs> react to the infant. So in a sense, the, the social measures and social aspects of cognition are important not just for the individual infant, but also for how it changes their environment. And by looking at these longitudinal data sets, we can gain more insight into how that happens. Okay. And this really emphasizes the importance of um, considering the multiple timescales involved in, in looking at these sorts of structures, because we're both interested in the developmental trajectories as a whole, right? but also how um, the mutuality in terms of turn-taking and how we adapt to each other on a turn-by-turn -turn basis is, is, the, is the developmental change itself, right? Developmental change originates in those turn-by-turn -turn interactions. Okay, yeah, I was just missing this one. So some of the questions that we can ask, right, are how caregivers and infants interact, but also how the infant changes over developmental time and how this influence the, influences the caregiver as well, right? If the caregiver is scaffolding the development of the infant in that <coughs> sense, then, then we would expect the adult input to change over time as well. But also infant status will obviously affect the infant, him or herself, but also the caregiver. And we can't associate, we can't um, attribute infant status, and by infant status I mean social, uh, social and cognitive development and so forth, motor development. Um, we can't assume that this is static over the course of development, but rather this changes with time as well. Okay, so that's sort of the complex situation we're dealing with here, <laughs> um, with, with which everyone is dealing with in, in infant development as well. Okay, so let's put our money where our mouth is, right, in terms of the lessons that we gain from the meta-analysis. We can't be um, arrogant and think that we, we <laughs> we're beyond that. Um, so by zooming in on this turn-by-turn -turn data, um, which is a data set that Ricardo has access to, um, and is a longitudinal data set where infants have been recorded uh, between, um, well, four or six sessions. Um, so we have a, this longitudinal timescale, um, and they're semi-structured sort of play sessions uh, where we're recording both the adults and the infants um, and extracting the, the latencies between when the adults and infants respond to each other. Okay. So again, the questions we can tackle, right, are developmental trajectories, which are here, and social and cognitive development, so to what extent do these influence caregiver and infant, but also we have measures of expressive language development as well. So here we're, not, we're relying not just on age as a sort of cover term for all of these individual trajectories of social and emotional development um, and expressive language development as well. We actually have these measures now. Okay, so here's some data. Um, and the last of these models was done running yesterday. So this is brand new. Uh, hot off the press um, data, <laughs> which also means that um, that we're still interpreting the results and still want to make changes to some of these models, but <coughs> here we are at least, okay? So um, the data that we have available here, so we thought to, just to run a traditional analysis first, right? So just as we did in the, um, the meta-analysis, we're not running a quadratic equation here, but we're running a linear model where we see um, some sort of stability in the infants, the parents speaking to infants without autism, and a slight decrease, but not a robust uh, decrease in uh, the latencies the caregivers to infants with autism um, 
produce. Um, if we look at, um, on the other hand, the child's apparent latencies with age, we see a linear decrease with, with age, right? So they're responding faster to the parental um, latencies um, with time. That is, so age and months on the x-axis, as that increases, the latency decreases. Okay, and that doesn't seem to differ for infants with and without autism. I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Is this yep. slopes for random effects? Or? These are models, uh, slopes extracted from the model. So it's with uncertainty. It's the uncertainty of the population okay. of the slope. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, then we also ran, so we have these social measures, um, and we ran, again, the same hierarchical Bayesian models um, where we have socialization score on the x-axis, and here we see some sort of increase um, in the degree to which uh, the, um, the infant scores higher on the socialization score, parents seem to respond with a slower latency, the higher it is. Which again is difficult to interpret. <laughs> um, and similarly here we have um, uh, no clear effects of um, socialization score on the extent to which child latency um, depends on this either. Um, then lastly, expressive language development. Here, for the parents um, of children without autism, we see quite a linear, um, or not a linear, but a um, no real effect of this, um, of the expressive language score, and we see a slight increase in infants with autism. Um, and then here we see something fairly interesting as well, where we have an interaction effect between um, autism and expressive language score. So infants with autism um, show a slower or a uh, faster um, response latency um, yes than infants without autism um, but again these are difficult to interpret and the way we've interpreted them so far is that we see a slight speed up right during infancy if we take age as a predictor um, we also want to change the predictor to session but that's a bit complicated to get into now, but you can ask about it in the questions. Um, we see some sort of effect of expressive language development and social measures, right? We're not quite sure how to interpret these results yet, but it may indicate that there's some sort of qualitative difference between what infants with autism and without autism hear and, and both produce as well. Uh, and produce as well. Um, but again, these are difficult results to interpret, um, especially in terms of the interaction engine hypothesis, right? They're very difficult to put into practice um, as of yet. But again, we're working, <laughs> still working on it. Um, so now the question is, well, what do we need now, right? That's the, those were the recommendations that we ourselves had <laughs> for, um, um, yeah, for conducting these studies. So how can we do it better now? And we were um, interested in extending the um, positing of hypotheses about how infant latencies change over time, because we, were, we found the interaction engine hypothesis quite um, difficult to support in its entirety, right? We had data that, was, that, were, sort of, that were not inconsistent with that result but a lot of things are not inconsistent with a lot of other things, right? So we want to be more precise about how we could um, get at the generative mechanisms involved in, in infant latencies. Um, and one of the ways to, to do this is to look at animal models, or non-human animal models, at least. Because right now we'd be dealing with the cognitive mechanisms involved in the development of turn-taking, right? But the generative mechanisms we've, we've sort of set aside. We're not sure how the patterns of turn-taking actually come into play through interactive processes. Um, so that's what we were interested in doing. And um, we said that what we need now is this interdisciplinary cross-pollination. We can use insights from animal models to, to look at how um, the structure of turn taking um, can take place in humans as well. Okay. So now we're turning from the more cognitive mechanism aspects um, of turn taking to the generative mechanisms. Yeah. Just a very quick uh, add-on is mm -hmm. that when we deal with humans, human animals, we have all lots of intuitions, and we just get driven by that. 
Yes. But when you have non human animals, researchers have actually to argue for what is going on and whether there is turn taking. And that's where the literature in that field is actually much better developed than in humans. Yeah, definitely. And that leads nicely on to um, the following because um, we've made a patent pending um, multi million dollar idea game, <laughs> which is called Is It Whale? Is it human or is it completely random? Um, and what we've done here is, <laughs> is not a multi-million dollar game. It's not going to, it's not going to take off. Um, but here we have three structures of, um, of turn taking. Okay, where I've, um, so this is a spectrogram and the higher pitched, um, we have a higher pitched interactant and a lower pitched interactant. Um, which are a perfect fifth apart, so it sounds good when they vocalize together. <laughs> and I've also panned them from side to side, so we'll actually get the experience of turn taking right in front of us. Um, so again, multi-million dollar idea. Um, but now we will listen to each one of these, and then your task is to choose which one is, is human, or which one is completely random, and which one are two whales. And if you think you can rely on the fact that whales take 15 to 20 minutes to exchange turns, you can't, because I've sped it up by a degree of 60, so it's <laughs> now not 15 minutes, but it's 15 seconds. Yeah. It's not the actual signal, right? It's simulated signal. It's the simulated signal, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so people aren't speaking with sine waves. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's based on the data. <laughs> okay, so here's the, here's the first one. Nope. <laughs> Second one. Um, okay, so put your hand up if you think the first one is human. <laughs> put it up if you think the second one is human. Mm -hmm. Put it up if you think the third one is human. Okay, yep. Okay, uh, should we do the same with whale? So put it up if you think the whale is the first one. Okay. That seems to be almost everyone. <laughs> so let's do the completely random one. Which one do you think that is? It says the first one. Or is it the second one? Okay, may I say the second one. Okay, that's very interesting. So the first one is the human one. Yeah. <laughs> second one is um, the whale <laughs> one. And the third one is completely random. So the one that you thought was, most of you thought was human, is actually the completely random one. And I created this by sampling two distributions with a random latency and a random duration of utterance and a random pause as well. So that really feeds into the point that Ricardo made as well, right? That we, we have intuitions about turn-taking that are difficult to get around. Um, and that's where we can turn to the animal world where you can't, you don't know how bush crickets take turns, right? You need to show that they actually do. And one of the ways to do so in, um, in the animal world or the non-human animal world is to um, compute the extent of difference from chance overlap. So just as we did with the turn-taking model, right, that's completely at random uh, whether they're overlapping or not, whether they're actually giving each other place to take turns. Um, so what we can do is to rotate the data of each participant to see whether there's evidence of mutual adaptation, so whether people are actually giving place to each other um, to take turns. So if we have the data set here with each individual dyad of caregivers, right, we can actually take the data from each individual infant and pair it with the other adult. And if we do that, right, we might expect a greater degree of overlap here because they're not responding to each other. 
Um, so if there's turn taking, right, then we would expect a greater degree of overlap with the randomly paired dyads of caregiver infants. And um, I did this on, the, on a Danish uh, data set, so looking at Danish infant caregivers. That was also what with the uh, spectrogram was based on, um, which looks like something like this, right? Response latencies between minus two and a half seconds and two and a half seconds. Um, and what we see here is that once we rotate the data sets, all of the rotated data sets, so I rotated it 26 times um, for each of the caregiver infant dyads, and we see a greater proportion of overlap for the rotated data sets as opposed to the baseline data or the original data, indicating that, okay, they are responding in some sense to each other. There is turn taking, taking place, even though we can't recognize it on a spectrum. <laughs> okay. Um, and, yeah, so this is sort of, that was a sort of quite met methodological point about our intuitions about um, turn taking. Um, but what we're also interested in are the generative mechanisms involved, right? What are the sort of patterns that are produced by the interacting periodic processes that we see in language development? And we've conducted a systematic review, again, of the turn-taking literature. And here, this time, it involved um, screening through 6,500 studies um, of turn-taking because we wanted to be quite broad in terms of, the, um, in terms of what we could find um, and in terms of all of the distinct uh, models that have been proposed for each individual species. So we have models such as a phase delay model, which have been proposed for bush crickets um, and anuran species, so things like toads and frogs, um, and a phase reset model for cicadas and so forth. Um, but we also see things like anti-synchrony models for seal pups and coupled oscillator models, which have also been proposed for the for the human um, for human language as well, um, to a certain extent. Um, and these maybe won't, won't mean much at the moment, um, but these are the models that have been proposed for, for, for all of these distinct um, animals, and those are the ones that we're interested in, right? We're interested in applying... We're not saying that human language is similar to these, to these species because there are different functions of turn-taking in these distinct animals, but we want to, in a way, get the mechanics of these individual computational models and see how we can use them in, in human language. Because in, for example, um, frogs, right, they tend to synchronize their calls and uh, vocalize at the same time to ward off predators to, as a mating display and also to confuse predators. And obviously we don't do that as humans, right? We don't, well, no, we don't. <laughs> we want to speak to your mate in class without your teacher getting annoyed. Yeah, good point, yeah, yeah. Or at football uh, or handball um, matches, yeah to ward off the uh, yeah, opponents. Um, but what, all of, what most of these models have in common, so we also found some models that don't use oscillator dynamics, but um, most of them do. And what we can do with computational models of turn-taking is to use them as a sort of um, quantitative hypothesis about um, what the hypothesis space looks like, right? So it's a process of exploration of these computational um, aspects of turn-taking, right? The mathematical structure of turn-taking, what can we produce assuming quite limited um, computational aspects? Um, and the central idea of these oscillator models is that we have oscillators that fluctuate between two extremes. So we have a, a state um, that, that is expressed, so in our case that would be a vocalization, and then we have another state where nothing happens, and then it happens again. So we have a periodic process where, where there's repetition of some sort of behavior. <clears throat> and interactions between these coupled oscillators then allow us to, to look at reciprocal adaptation and emergent patterns and produce things like synchrony and anti-synchrony and so forth. So I've, um, here I've made an animation where um, you need to uh, imagine that um, the animals vocalize when they hit a point of one, okay? When they hit one on the y-axis. So here we have an animal vocalizing now and now, now and now, okay? So that's how these computational models, models work. And what we're then interested in, what's going on?
what they're with and interested in is the phase shift between these two vocalizations, right? We're interested in the latency between when each wave is hitting the boundary of vocalizing. Um, and another way to visualize this is as a unit circle. So each wave is sort of traveling through space um, at t, t divided by two, and then at t, then they vocalize there, right? So there, there's an angle at which, um, at which one of the animals is vocalizing and the other isn't. And then we're interested in the latency between the two. So these two are equivalent, right? We're interested in the phase shift in the waves of the oscillators that are producing these patterns. Okay, and again, right, we can, by positing some sort of interactions between these oscillators, we can, we can um, generate patterns that either generate synchrony, but also alternation um, and other patterns as well. Okay, so now we've been, um, we've been coding up all of these models from all of these distinct um, papers and all these distinct animals. And so we have help from uh, Sigurd Sautzen, who's our research assistant um, and funded by an IMC seeding grant as well. Uh, yeah. And here we have um, a, the results from a baseline model. So again, right, this was the, uh, what we all thought was human turn taking in the spectrogram. If we code up this model where we have no sort of interaction between each of the, in, between each of the vocalizations, right? There's no sort of adaptation to each other. Then we would see a pattern like this, right? In the, in the angles between um, the vocalizations, we just see sort of random scattering all over the place. They're not adapting to each other. And this will make more sense when we look at some of the other models as well. But this is from zero to 360 degrees. Okay. So if we then look like at something like the anti-synchrony model, and the anti-synchrony model is, has been proposed in uh, seal pups, um, where one of the um, interactants, so the seal pup, is reacting to, um, is trying to um, vocalize at the halfway point between the previous period, between the previous latency of the other person's period. So they're always trying to hit in between when the other person, when the other seal is vocalizing. <laughs> um, and we see a pattern like this. Okay, so we see some random fluctuations with, which can be modeled with the standard deviation, right? But most of the vocalizations are sort of happening at the alternation um, site. So they're sort of um, always trying to alternate with the seal pup they're interacting with. And this can be captured by precisely coupling the oscillators together, right? By having these oscillators interact with each other. Okay, and then we have the phase delay model, which is the last model we'll, we'll have a look at or briefly sketch out because we can't really go into details. But here, each interactant is sort of adapting to each other um, and pushing their vocalization or the latency of their vocalization back and forth until they eventually reach a sort of synchronous outcome. So this is what we see for frogs and anuran species um, um, and bush crickets as well. And here we see something like this, right, where most of the um, phase delay angles are um, centered at around 0, 360 degrees. So we're sort of trying to hit, or the bush crickets or frogs are trying to hit synchrony by, by using this model. Or well, they're not using the model, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> and another way we can uh, plot this is by looking at the previous phase angle and then whether they are actually adapting to that phase angle, right? So if the previous phase angle is, uh, is slightly pushed to the left, then we also see that the next phase angle of the person responding to that is also pushed to the left. So here we're sort of really digging into the dynamics, right? It's very different from when we were looking at the infant caregiver plots, right, where we just simply have a standard latency and trying to estimate the latency that they're responding with. Here we're zooming in on the actual interactive dynamics and the generative patterns that they, that they produce. Okay, so then we can actually look at some child data, right, and use this framework and use, use phase angles to describe um, interactions between, between child and caregivers. And here we see for the Danish data, infant caregiver data, um, the children are sort of all over the place, right? This reminds us of the baseline, baseline model, um, where there's no clear interaction between, um, between what's going on. Um, but if we look at caregivers to child interactions, on the other hand, here we have, this is a sample from, from the data set as a whole, but most um, seem to uh, behave in this way. 
but we see quite a lot of jitter around what's going on, but we also see some sort of um, propensity to, to come in at the uh, halfway point of the period of the child latency. Right, so it's sort of, they're, they're, they're aiming for interaction. They're just like seal pups. Yeah. So you can ask a question about the graphs again, sir. Yes. Um, is uh, size and colors redundant, or is there different types of information material conveyed by it? Um, so the colors are the number of vocalizations. Okay. Yeah, so. And the size of? The, the angles are the same. Okay. Right, yeah. so 30 degree angles for each one, yeah. But they say the higher, the more they are close to the yeah. outer edge, the more vocalizations there are in that band of phase angles. Okay, so in a sense, the color and the size convey the same amount of information, or the same type of information. Yes. Or, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just one thing. It gets you in a better journal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and then here we have the phase response curve as well, so as I said before, that um, if we take the previous phase angle and look at how um, caregivers and how ch children respond to each other, we see sort of linear relationships as well, so the longer the period of the previous vocalization, the longer the, the latency of the next vocalization as well, which is quite neat that we can, that we can do that, and we do it despite seeing um, random fluctuations for the, for the children as well. Um, so locally, they might be responding um, in a way that's commensurate with the um, latency of the, of the adult. But if we look overall, they might not, um, which is, again, is interesting. Then we also, so again, right, inspired by these animal models, by zooming in on um, what's going on in the caregiver-infant interactions. So here we have the data with um, autistic, um, with infants with and without autism again. Um, and we see here that, so this is a, what's known as a dyadic coupling plot, or a dyadic coupling model, um, where we're, it's a multivariate model, so we're, details are a bit uh, complicated, but essentially we're taking account of the, inf of the correlation between the infant response latency and the adult respon response latency at the same time for each dyad, and seeing to what extent are they actually uh, adapting to each other from previous, uh, from the previous adult latency and vice versa. Okay, so we see here some sort of, again, linear relationship um, for the parents of infants with autism, which indicates that the longer the previous period of the child, the longer they respond in, in the adult. Um, and again, we see a similar pattern for child response latency. Um, so we see sort of the interactive dynamics between quite locally taking place. Um, but, yes. But we have some other interpretations of this data which we, which we might get into because I think we're running a bit out of time. Um, so that's co-regulation, but also we need um, to look at self-regulation in the sense that, well, to what extent do you change your infant response latency or your response latency based on your previous response latency? So we might expect if you have a long latency in the previous turn, maybe you have a short latency following that sort of trying to balance, co-regulate, or self-regulate your, um, your own dynamics, um, turn-taking dynamics. And here again we see quite an interesting result with linear um, relationships between the previous adult latency and, and the actual adult laten response latency, meaning that we might see these waves of longer latencies, which then go to shorter latencies and vice versa. That's the sort of current interpretation that we have. Okay. So the take-home message then from looking at turn-taking in all of these distinct um, contexts is um, that we have quite a lot to learn from this interdisciplinary cross-pollination and we're still learning. The models that we have here aren't necessarily the, the ones, we'll have <laughs> um, ones we'll have later on. But I think there's value in looking at um, communication systems from a sort of common computational framework because both in terms of um, to ensure compa comparability between species uh, but also just because the mechanics uh, of the um, computational models in the animal world are much more developed in the infancy world and we should take advantage of that. Okay. And 
one of the last outcomes of this is that we're going to make an R package to simulate data from these non-human computational models. Um, we could even combine it with the uh, spectrogram sine wave um, aspects of it, um, so you can hear the different types of details um, eventually. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much.